I've always been generous, sometimes I guess to a fault. Um, and I've always, from a very, very young childhood, um, had such a compassion for people and animals and, you know, things that I knew I had a lot less than I had and maybe I could help. And, you know, compassion to me is, it's a call of action. It's not just a word. You know, you can say I care, but when it's compassion, it's like it goes down in your gut and it just pulls it out of you and you're just like, it's a call to action. It's something that I can't not do. The minute I walked in this church, I felt the grace of this church. I knew the mission of this church. I know where the money goes. I know what's in people's hearts. And I know how committed we are to our community and, and our members. <clears throat> and Owen Wood, it was, it's just been amazing, especially doing the diaper bank and, you know, getting to know people that don't have near as much as you do. But if, if you needed a shirt, they'd take the shirt off their back and give it to you. And that's, you know, that's, that's beautiful. And that's like, they're like the salt of the earth. Barbara, I am grateful for you sharing a part of yourself with us and also helping us begin to think about the connection between generosity and compassion. I know it's not always easy to be on camera. You did great, and I'm grateful for you um, helping us put into perspective what this series is about, which is the good life. How can we live into generosity? Um, and I know that we use this word generosity a lot in the church, specifically around annual giving campaigns and budgets and offering plates and pledges. I get it. We're doing it again. So yeah, that's a point well taken, right? And um, I also realize that in our context, um, it can be used as simply a tool to to generate funds for programming. Um, and I, um, I know that there are some of us who would prefer the kind of annual giving talk to be kind of separated out from worship. And I, I'm, sometimes I'm there with you, right? It's not always easy to connect what we do with our finances to our faith. But um, the truth is, uh, Jesus does not give us that luxury to separate it, right? Uh, how we live out our faith is directly tied to what we do with our money and what we do with that which has been entrusted to us. And, um, and so it's always a bit kind of nerve-wracking when we kind of enter into this series. But I, I want to just say, like, I get it. I'm also the type of person who, when NPR is doing their fall kind of fundraiser, right, I'll, I'll change the channel or station until, uh, until they're done, right? I've done my part. I'm monthly contributor to uh, NPR, and uh, I think I've been given, you know, 10 bucks every month for like five years. I haven't adjusted it, right? And I'll just come back when that's over and enjoy my NPR programming, right? Uh, I'd probably increase my gift if they stopped playing so much of the BBC uh, early in the morning, but um, I'm not the program director. Uh, and so I understand that uh, generosity uh, can kind of feel like it's a, simply a way to talk about some sort of transaction, right? And often the formula is, is something like this. We all have our own formulas on how we're going to give of our money, but it's usually something around our preferences, right? Our priorities and our means, and somehow we get to like X amount of dollars, that's how we understand giving and generosity. But here's the truth that we'll be exploring for the next four weeks. Generosity is not simply about what you give. It's not how you work out that formula. Generosity, first and foremost, is a gift that God has given us as individuals and given us as the church. To really live the good life, a life centered in the gospel, right? A life that is truly flourishing because of God's grace and love in our, li in our life, we must become more and more generous. Generosity isn't simply about giving so others have enough. It's about giving so we can live ourselves a better life. Generosity makes our life better. And each week, 
we're going to, to look at how generosity develops within us a key part of what it means to be a deeply devoted follower of Jesus Christ. How does practicing generosity shape and form us as a people of faith? And Barbara's video uh, reveals to us that some of us have an easier time being generous than others. I don't know if there's uh, many folks in our church that are more generous than her. But I do know that we all can become more and more generous through our commitment to the gospel. Because the first way we will come to see generosity as a lifestyle is uh, to be transformed, is to put it into practice. And so our text this morning invites us into this conversation between generosity just being a word and generosity having some sort of output or outcome in the life of real community. So Acts 2 is kind of the first offering that we have. Um, It's the first offering story we have as a church. Jesus has lived among those who who are the earliest of Christians. His death and resurrection have occurred, right? And he has ascended into heaven. And at the very beginning of Acts 2, something pretty remarkable happens. Pentecost, right, uh, takes place. And the Holy Spirit then is given to the followers of Jesus so they may be empowered and equipped equipped to do the work of the church. And that work is hard work as we continue to read in the book of Acts. But here in this text this morning is the very first picture we have of the church gathering together. It's a snapshot of how they organized and operated as a community of faith. And this is what we know about the earliest Christians. They had devoted themselves to four things, which leads into the text I'm about to read. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. We read that in Acts chapter 2. They spent time together in community. They ate together. And they prayed together. It's a pretty good church meeting. Not a lot of committees. Not a lot of uh, discussion about the color of the carpet, right? They learned something. They ate together. They practiced being in community, fellowship, right? And then they prayed together. And so here's the result of what happens when a group of people commit to that work. Acts 2, verses 43 through 47. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to the number those who are being saved for the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. So this little snapshot here of the community, I think, speaks to something deeply profound for us, even today, some 2,000 years later, because scholars believe that before we get the word church, right, uh, before we get that, there was another word that was used to describe these gatherings of early Christians. And scholars have kind of found out that the word was koinonia, right? Which is Greek for the community. And so these first Christians were seen and labeled as the community. That was their name, the community. The community was made up of folks who had taken on a new way of being in the world, and they had begun shedding their individualistic tendencies for a notion of serving and being with others, devaluing self in favor of we, right? And the only way they were able to do this, because if you're like me, that's actually a pretty difficult thing to do, especially in today's world, the only way that they were able to do that, do this was through a spirit of generosity, and that was a gift that was given to them at Pentecost. And here's how it worked. If you had something to give, you gave it. And if you needed something, you took it. 
You have extra, you give it. You needed something, you took it. This early community was so radical that by this model of generosity, they were truly able to live for the sake of community and not just for themselves. And here's the most remarkable thing. They chose to do this, right? They chose to do this. This wasn't formed out of obligation or duty or guilt. It was a choice they made to live this way. Generosity was the key to this way of living. And before there were budgets and buildings, which there are, and before there were committees and staff members, which there are, generosity allowed these folks to live for one another, and it developed within them a community that was forged out of compassion for all who were a part. The ability to be generous was then a divine gift for the community. It was a gift for those who gave, and it was a gift for those who received. And at some point, everyone in the community, right, would be in a place of needing something. And at some point, everyone would be in a place of giving. I think that this is both um, a radical way of living in community and the call that we have as a church to practice this type of generosity. And I don't think I need to prove to you that being generous is a gift for those who give and it is a gift for those who receive, right? I think we can comprehend that, but I'm not trying to make an academic point or trying to prove something to you. Rather, I just want you to do a little thought experiment with me. I want you just to think about a time when someone was generous with you. They gave you something, not out of duty or obligation, but simply out of compassion. Just think of a moment when someone gave you something. What did that feel like? What did you accomplish because of that generosity? So while you're thinking about your story, I'm going to tell you one of mine, and I have plenty. I've been blessed by other people's generosity in my own life. I'm sure I could spend hours talking about that, but I want to tell you a story about what happened to me when I moved to Alaska. You all know that for... For those who know me, you know that I moved to Alaska. I I graduated from college and I drove up to Anchorage and to start working for Habitat for Humanity. Um, And I was in AmeriCorps Vista. And that meant that I didn't get paid a whole lot. um, And it meant that I worked a lot. It was kind of this uh, government program that uh, took individuals, put them in places of need and said, get after it. Uh, I worked with a nonprofit, Habitat for Humanity. And... um, And when I first got there, we were encouraged by the state office of AmeriCorps in Alaska to apply for food stamps because the cost of living kind of formula that they were using was not keeping up with the cost of food. It's very expensive to buy food in Alaska. A can of Rotel when I lived in Anchorage, because I tried to make, uh, you know, cheese dip when I watched football, uh, was um, $3.25. It was expensive, right? So I applied for food stamps, and I, um, you know, so I was living on food stamps. That's how I was purchasing the majority of my food, and um, that was stressful. As a privileged person who knew that I could, if I had to, call my parents to bail me out, it was still stressful. I can't imagine what walking that tightrope's like for individuals who uh, rely on the $187.97 that was put into my bank account each month so I could buy food. So it was February, and I was, um, I was in the Safeway on 14th Street in Anchorage, and um, it was cold. It was like three degrees at night, and um, I didn't have enough money at the register. Some of you may have heard me tell this story. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, it's embarrassing. Um, it's also uh, a bit anxiety producing to get to the end of the register and not have enough for everything that was checked in and put into your bags. And so here I am with this, you know, 17-year-old uh, Alaskan who does not really uh, care, just needs to finish the job, right, finish the transaction. So he's working for Safeway, and I'm, I'm 
taking things out of the bag and I'm saying, hey, will you just take this off? Or started with all the vegetables uh, and then I started with the... <laughs> you laughed. They were the most expensive. <laughs> and then I, I gave up all, basically all the whole foods. And, um, and so I'm trying to do this thing, this math equation in my head and it's not working, right? He's not scanning it out fast enough, and I'm getting frustrated, and there's this old woman. She's in her 80s. She's, uh, um, she's an Alaskan native, and she uh, sees what's happening, and she offers to pay for the difference, right? So I give 100, and I think I had $163 uh, in, in my account, and she paid for the rest, the remainder, which was like 30-something dollars. She paid with the same card that I was paying with. She paid with her food stamps card. And I remember, um, I remember you kind of have to like psych yourself up, or at least she did if you're from Texas, to like go out into the night, you know, because three degrees outside. So there's this whole thing where you're kind of like bundling up before you like, because it's so hot in the store, so you take everything off and then you bundle back up, and there's this kind of weird place in grocery stores where everyone's just doing that act. So she comes up to me and, you know, we're talking. She can tell that I feel a little guilty and I have some shame. But she asked me, you know, what I was doing in Alaska, and I told her I was working for Habitat for Humanity and she got the biggest smile on her face and she said, you know what? My sister lives in a Habitat for Humanity home and she says, y'all are doing good work. Have a good night. And she just walks out into the dark. Never saw her again, obviously. And I think we get to a point where we begin to realize that receiving and being brought into this community is life-giving, and it begins to transform us from this uh, idea that we live solely for ourselves to this notion that we see in Acts 2, that it is possible to live in community with one another. But the glue, the way that it starts, is our ability to be generous, to practice generosity. So you've thought about a time when folks were generous with you. I want you to think now a, a time when you were generous, when you were able to give. How did that feel? And, you know, take yourself to that place, right? Of you being able to give, not out of duty or obligation, but out of compassion and an understanding of the gospel. The story I'm about to tell you isn't really my story, it's really our story. So I get to, sometimes I get to tell stories that are our story, right? Um, we had a member of the congregation who, um, who, who had a, you know, an old car that broke down, the transmission went out, and there's some other things that needed to be fixed. And uh, this individual came into my office and kind of told me what the situation was. And um, this individual uh, didn't have enough to, to, to fix it. But they just got a new job and they needed the car to get to the new job and they're very stressed out and it was clearly going to be a, a source of, of a big burden for them to try to solve for this equation, right? This story isn't unique, by the way. <laughs> so before we get on our horses and saying like, why don't people just work harder? I, I think like the truth is it's really hard to do hard work and it rarely is about desire, okay? So this individual was about to lose their job because their car broke down, they don't have enough in their bank account, and because of your generosity, because you give, I was able to go into the pastor's fund and we worked out a deal. It was both life-giving for this individual and for me as a pastor. I said, look, I'm gonna pay for, we'll, the church will pay for half of this bill up front. And then this individual said, I want to have some ownership over this too. And essentially we worked out a deal where this individual was able then to pay back into the pastor's fund the other half on like an interest fee kind of agreement, right? And I tell you this story because I want you to, to recognize that what you give to this church is really going to very tangible, real things. And your generosity is making our community stronger and healthier. Because this individual, right, falls in love with the church because of your generosity and ends up being a leader within our church and ends up leading ministries out of our church. 
because they found a place here. Now, I don't know if they would have found a place here if I would have said, sorry, we don't have a way to like pay for $4,000 worth of a car repair. I don't know how the story ends if we do something different, but I do know how the story ends because we are a generous church. The challenge is seeing generosity as an essential part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It is not just simply charity, and it is not simply obligation or duty. We give because it transforms our community into a more compassionate church. There is a direct line between our ability to be generous and the level of compassion we display for one another and the broader community. And so here's what we're going to do. I I, like debated on whether or not to do this. I scrapped it last night and then I had a nice little moment in my car this morning where I was listening to Willie Nelson sing Across the Borderline and I had a little uh, Enneagram 4 moment and I started crying and like, I don't know, uh, I just felt like very open, right? And so I, I come in this morning and I tell the staff, hey, I want to do this thing, right? And the thing is this, it's um, basically if you need $100, the church is going to give you $100. And you, if you have an extra $100, we want you to give it to the church so then we can give it to other individuals, right? It's that simple. I was going to explain it, uh, I was explaining it to the staff this morning. I was doing a horrible job. It's hard to tell facial expressions when everyone's wearing masks. And I, it was just like a blank stare and I'm like stumbling over my words and I could tell that like, I don't know if they're going to go for this. Um, And then an individual walked in this morning, no lie, walked in and said, hey, can I speak to the pastor? I need some help. So we're going to do it. It's as simple as this. If there's something in your life that you need $100, whether that's because you um, are having a hard time picking up hours at work or a bill's late or you don't need to justify it to me. (laughs) It's not how this thing works. You don't have to prove to me that you need $100. If you are having a hard time struggling financially right now, it is 2021, it's hard out there. I want to be able to to leverage the church's resources to give you $100. We as a church will give you $100. All you have to do is email me at pastor at wrumc.org pastor at wrumc.org. Email me, just tell me what's up, and we're going to send you $100. The way this works, though, is if you have an extra $100 to give, above and beyond what you normally give, if you have an extra $100 right now, you feel called to give it, all you have to do is go to wrumc.org slash give and just cl- click the pastor's fund. Some of us have more (laughs) than we need at this moment in time. And so there are some of us in this church who need right now because of the way life is for them. And we are going to do our best to meet the needs of the community simply by being more generous. By practicing generosity, we can be more compassionate with each other. This is our shared work together. I'm not going to make any decisions about where that $100 goes or who gets it. If someone needs it and they ask for it, we're going to give it to them. And if you have um, uh, a need, I don't want you to feel like you can't do it. I'm not going to share your name with anyone. This is completely anonymous. But if you have an extra $100, simply go to wrumc.org slash give, click on the pastor's fund, and donate online. And we're going to begin to just see how practicing generosity can lead us to be more compassionate with one another and deepen our trust that the Holy Spirit is indeed active and moving in our midst. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, help us to find our place in the midst of this worship series. Help us Um, to trust that giving is indeed an act of faith and not something we do out of obligation. 
Help us to see that through our generosity, whether we are receiving or we are giving, we are practicing what we preach. And through this practice, may we continue to be transformed. For the world needs a church that is living more generously with one another and more compassionate to the neighborhoods a church calls home. Help us live up to the mission and ministry you've set before us. And may we continue to be a place for all people. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.